All right, today we're going to talk about the IMUF filter and compare that to the classic PT1 filter, see the differences between the two, and talk about what the variables do and how it adjusts the filtering. Before we get into it, I want to give credit where credit is due. A gentleman named Edward really brought this to my attention, was really taking a look at it a lot himself, was helping me through looking at the code. Also, the EMU devs are taking deeper dives on this as well. They're trying to understand more and more about the filtering code in the IMUF versus the PT1 filters and things of that nature. So it's not just me alone. Edward uh, did the initial work on this Excel file I'm going to show you too. I did then add in some raw noise from a flight log that I had and then added pivot tables and some other fancy fancy excel stuff to make it a little bit easier for me to navigate stuff through because it's there's a lot of data when you add in logging data because it's like almost 10,000 rows of data so you got to manage that and use pivot tables and stuff like that so let's get into it at the end of the day the imuf filter should really be called the dynamic pt1 filter it is a first order low pass filter and that might be tough for some people to swallow but it's right here in the code if you look at it this is the pt1 filter code the classic pt1 filter codes and beta flight, clean flights, probably an INAV, it's the same thing. Uh, EMU flight, here you can see we're actually looking at EMU flight. It's the previous gyro state plus the cutoff times the new gyro state minus the previous gyro state. That's essentially a classic PT1 filter. That's just how simple it is. So all this, you know, trying to understand filters, it's not that complicated. The K factor is really just the cutoff. It's not in hertz range so it's converted some but at the end of the day it's taking whatever you have the cutoff entered like 100 hertz or 200 hertz it's con doing some math on that and it's producing a variable that's the k variable that goes directly into the equation looking at the common filter it is the again the k factor times the input minus the previous state now when you look at these two equations you can see the difference see how this has a previous state variable here and this doesn't the only difference is this plus plus equals used which is a different way to code it. So when you do plus equals, it takes whatever this variable is currently and just adds this to it. So here, they didn't use plus equals, they just literally put the variable and put the plus and did it that way. So two ways to code it, but it's the same result. There is the difference of a predictive state between the two. So in the classic PT1, you're not using predictive state. You're literally using just the last filtered sample from the previous loop iteration. Whereas in the FKF and the uh, IMUF filter, they're using this predictive state. And it's not as fancy as it really sounds. It's the last sample plus the current sample minus the last sample again. So let's look at it in cell a little bit here because I think it can make it a little easier so you're not looking at code. Okay, as we're looking at this, it's, it's important to understand that it's really just a flying computer, right? You have a loop iteration. So every four kilohertz, so it's 4,000 samples per second. So as it's doing these samplings of where the gyro reading is, as it's flying around, it's doing that 4,000 times per second, you're getting this data input coming in. You have these loop iterations that are tracked. This actually comes from the log. So I'm on the 70,500 loop iteration plus and it's just one sample after the next. Now you can see even in the loop samples here, I, it's every two. Why is it every two? Well, I was at a 4K logging rate, but I had a 2K sampling rate. So my log here only has 2K data. So it's kind of every other that we're looking at. But we're, you know, when we're using the filter comparison, we're, we're doing that based off the same data. So it's apples to apples. If I click on the calculations here for the classic PT1, you can see it's pretty simple. I have the previous gyro samples filter gyro samples in blue here so it's the previous gyro sample plus the k times the current minus the previous and these are the this blue stuff is the previous filtered one the k value is again uh, pretty simple it's the hertz that you have entered so 100 hertz 200 hertz whatever's entered in or the dynamic ones move up and down with throttle but at the end of the day it's that value times pi times 2 divided by the sample frequency so it's pretty simple stuff. You can see it and then you just fill down, fill all those, see how that's smoothing out these, this raw input. Next, let's look at the predictive step. So in the predictive step, it's again, super simple math. It's the previous output of the filtered state plus the previous minus the last predicted. So you're just, it's just that, that real simple math. Don't let yourself think that this stuff in your mind is more than it really is. It's usually just all multiplication and addition. So you can see the predictive state and then the Kalman filter code again, we're gonna click on that. 
Again, you can see these, these variables here, instead of using the previous sample, which would be uh, the previous filtered sample, we're actually using that predictive state. And then the, um, the K factor here is different. It's not a fixed K factor. This actually modulates in the IMUF filter. So there's a difference there. It's basically, again, a dynamic PT1 where the cutoff varies as as it's filtering and so we'll talk about that so at the core of it you can download this spreadsheet i'm not going to go into all the little nitty-gritty details you can see you can click on the cells and follow it through but this is the core filtering for the imuf and we have the imuf over here which is really just a pt1 so that you have the pt1 filter code here and the pt1 filter code here this is using a static k value this is using the dynamic K value that's calculated over here through this R, P, next P, and the E value. But this modulation starts to occur. The modulation is really based on this equation here. So the calculation is just taking the variance of a certain amount of samples, if it's either 10 samples, 32 samples, or 64 samples, previous input samples, and it's, it's the variance of a number of samples, whatever you tell it, because a W is a factor you'd enter into EMU flight, times the to the, in our case, the half power. That modulates that, and as it goes up and down, then you have different samples, so on and so forth. Then there's a P equation, then it calculates the next P, and there's this E factor. You can go look at all this stuff yourself. Uh, at the end of the day, we're gonna skip forward onto this and start to look at some charts. So on this chart, I have overlaid the three different filtering methods, right? You have the classic PT1, which is the blue. You have the butterfly, the old butterfly, FKF was caused all that stir and controversy like two years ago. And then you have the IMUF filter from the Helio. You can see a couple things on here that are really interesting to me. The predictive step methodology of just doing that math adds noise to the signal. So to really get the equivalent amount of smoothing, you really need a lower cutoff. So if say if I wanted to match a PT1 filter of 100 and 28 hertz. So say I just had a, a PT1 filter 128 hertz and it was the cutoff and I wanted to see what would the equivalent butterfly filtering be. Well I'd have to mess around with the Q. The R is usually 88 but you move the Q value up and down and, and see what you get for equivalency there. You'd really need a 78 hertz cutoff for the equivalent butterfly filtering. So what's that mean? That means that the signal is, if it would be you know, the same exact cutoff, the butterfly signal would be more noisy. It would be not as smooth. The phase delay would be less since it's the same core equation. It's just how smooth is the output. So on this sheet right now, I have entered in the old butterfly defaults, which was a Q of 1500 and an R of 88. And you can see that resulted in a, in a basically the same output as a 78 hertz PT1 low pass filter. The next thing is the IMUF filter. So the IMUF, you know, these were the cutoffs of the static uh, filters. Now, you know, we all know in beta flight that the PT1 filters aren't really static anymore, right? As you move throttle, the PT1 filters move up with it. But this IMUF is different. The green shaded area here isn't based on, you know, me moving the throttle up and down. This is just modulating based on noise and it really has a lot to do with that R value looking at the number of samples and doing the variance of them and doing to the half power of that and that's moving this thing up and down moving the cutoff up and down as you can see since it all flows back into just making you know that between the W and the R and the P and the next P and the E value you know, at the end of the day, all that stuff that's going on over there, and you can explore it for yourself in the Excel file. You can download this for yourself at the tiny.cc forward slash UAV tech. It's down at the bottom of all the files. You can see the file name up here on the screen. That all results in just a K value that's put into the PT1 filter equation, where you look at this gray shaded area and you see that the cutoff is below these this PT1 line here. You can see it will be smoother output than a PT1 filter at 128 hertz. And where it's above it, it would be, the output would not be as smooth as 128 hertz. So it modulates up and down. And really what you wanna see is, or what I would wanna see is that in prop wash, you know, like here, cause this is a section of prop wash, by the way. So I'm inverting around and doing like a split S and kind of uh, sagging into it that, you know, do we have, 
you know, section of prop wash, what is the filtering and phase delay? And you can see here, although this is spiking up, it's kind of spiking up too late. So you actually have more phase delay uh, here because you can see the reds behind it. Same here as well, same here as well. So there it's, you know, it's filtering more. Although these are spiking up above, it's a little too late. Uh, and, you know, when, once you're past this point where it's pushing down, you're really trying to correct for, you know, getting back to set point at that point. So it's, it's a little late on that scenario. We can zoom in and take a closer look at all these areas. You can see generally there's a little bit more phase delay on everyone. Now here we do not. You can see there's actually less phase delay in this spike. So that spike uh, going up um, was fast enough that it you know, resulted in a little less filtering, which honestly we don't need the filtering during the spike going up because it's pretty smooth. You know, the, the dark area here, the black is the gyro trace and you can see it's not really resulting in any additional spikes here. So there it did pretty well. You can see here it's doing pretty well, a little less phase delay. Generally, there's it's a little more noisy in some of these sections. So looking at some of the details there, hopefully you can see for yourself that sometimes it's better, sometimes it's, it's not. It's a little bit more noisy, I would say, in general um, than the PT1 at 128 hertz, um, but that can be adjusted too. So let's talk about the adjustments so we can clear up some of those things. Like what does W do? Because a lot of the language from the Helio, Butterfly Helio days was not very specific. So if I look here at, just keep a mind's eye of how this looks for, I, right now I have a W of 20. And look at this green shaded area. If I go over here and I switch this to back to the Emu Flight default of 32, and then come back in. So you can see how that's gonna change right there. So you can see what it does is as the W increases, it smooths out how much the cutoff is moving up and down in the IMUF filter, which I'm gonna call henceforth a dynamic PT1, because that's really what it is. It's a PT1 filter that has a dynamic cutoff, no different than Betaflight's dynamic PT1 filters. In Betaflight, they're using the throttle to modulate it. Here, we're using pass noise, the variance and the half power of it to modulate it but at the end of the day, it's still a PT1 filter. And again, you can see that the spikes don't go up as high, so it's not moving the filter up as much, but it's kind of a smooth, it's a smoother response. Let's see how it looks at 64. And you'll be able to see the change in that right there. So now in that scenario, we even lose some of the spikes here. So now we don't have any spiking in this area. We stay below what the output would be of a 128 hertz PT1 filter, we have a couple spikes here. So at the end of the day, you would get a smoother result for the overall flight, but it's gonna have more phase delay, so it's not gonna help you for prop wash scenarios. One of the other interesting things that you learn, when, and you can look at the code for E, this is the variable. So the modulation based on previous gyro data, that's the R value stuff that's influenced by the fixed variable W, how many samples you're using. But the other thing that Helio had in is as you move the sticks around, it changed the filtering. That's really encapsulated in this E value here, which is the absolute of the of one minus the set point over the predicted sample reading. And when you look at that math and how that works, they would talk about like where you're near the center stick, it's smoother, but when you do like a full stick extent, it, it moves the filter up or uh, it does less, they would say it does less filtering. That's actually the opposite of what it actually does. So during near center stick with that equation, it's actually less smooth. And as you're at full stick, it's more smooth. You can see it here. The center stick is right here. This is zero for this. So the set point's at zero. And as I'm moving up, the stick's going up and I'm only going up to uh, 40 degrees per second. So it's not that far. But as I go farther and farther out, you can see it's actually getting smoother here. Now, there's no free lunch, so what's that mean? There's more phase delay. So as you're out at farther extents of your stick and you're getting into a prop wash scenario out there, you, you're gonna get more prop wash. Uh, as you get closer to center stick and some prop wash develops, you wouldn't get it. But when you're talking about you know getting smooth forward flight and it's because of the you know, amazing IMUF or the dynamic PT1 here, I wouldn't see how. It's not how the math points out. So. 
Now with this, the EMU devs are, and a couple of people are looking at the E equation and saying, hey, you know, should we be doing this a different way? Should we inverse that? So that might change in the, in the future coming up, but you, you can see what we have for the existing code. Also with this, just to make sure I'm perfectly clear on the current beta release of EMU Flight, the version 0.1.0, as in my last video, the, the IMUF code's just not active at all. So the default, I believe, is a static uh, PT1 filter at 90 hertz, and then um, some D-term filtering. That's what you're getting. That's what you've been flying if you've been flying EMU Flight. Now for the Helio boards that was working, and I didn't make that clear distinction in my last video. So the IMUF was working with EMU Flight on a Helio flight controller, but if you had any other flight controller, the IMUF was not working. In the next beta release, I would surely think it would be working. One of the things with that is somebody should be logging it. I'm, I hope somebody is. I, I didn't, I didn't, I'm not on the next beta release or anything like that. I haven't played with it, but I hope the devs have logged it with a debug mode to confirm it. A lot of this stuff people just, it seems, which friggin' blows my mind, is they just code stuff up, go fly it, and in the case of the EMU flight thing, there was lots of people that were convincing themselves, like, ah, oh, yeah, this is flying great, and then it's not even working. So, yeah, it just, it just kills me with some of that things. Like, you don't know what's going on unless you log it. That's what logging is for, and that's what debug modes are for, so you can code stuff, make a debug mode, and make sure your code's working. Don't... So, anyways, let's get back onto this. Let's talk about Q quick. Q, let's see what that does when that varies. You can see I have the Q value here of 1500, that was the default for Butterfly. Let's change that up. I think it's in Emu Flight, it's 3000. Let's change it to 9000, just so we can see the difference between the two. So let's just do 9000 here, hit enter, and you can see this one will change. It's just linked to that. And I'll go back over to the chart and keep your eye on the red line and the yellow line, which both change. And you can see what changes there. So as you increase your Q, the cutoffs, this area of green, generally moved up. So when the cutoff's moving up, the filtering is less, phase delay is less as well. So the higher cues in general across the board, you have less filtering in general. Whereas the W, that's changing how much it's rising or not, you know, how much it's peaking out, how, how dynamic is the PT1 being. A lower W gives you a more dynamic PT1. A higher W gives it less dynamic. So if you're interested in smooth flight, you'd want kind of trending down towards a lower Q. So just to look at some numbers here, let's put in a 3000 Q and a 10,000 W, I mean a 10 W. So you can see you have less, you know, you kind of have moderate filtering there, but then the, the cutoff, the raising of it is much more. So this area underneath here didn't push down all that much. So, you know, to have that pretty agile so that as uh, the, you're getting into some prop wash and things of that nature, so it's raising those low passes up really quick, you actually want to trend your Ws lower. And you might want to try down in the 20s, 10 maybe, uh, you can't go below two samples um, because of the power thing. It doesn't work like that. You're not allowed to. You shouldn't be allowed to. I hope you're not allowed to. Flight controller will probably crash if it allows you to go below two for samples. But yeah, two. Let's look what five looks like. This is a W of five. You can see it even gets even more spiky. That's, to me, that's a little too much. Now you're, this could start to introduce kind of noise in itself because you have all this little spiking. You can almost see how it's kind of more noisy. This next one here is 20. That's what 20 looks like. So that seems that seems pretty reasonable. Uh, one concern that you could get into with a crazy low W, if you're somebody that's really on the extremes, is you could get ringing possibly because filters kind of have a step response in themselves when you make them dynamic and moving the cutoffs up and down. That's not that much of a concern though with a PT1 filter. It's definitely a concern with like a bi-quad kind of filter. You got to watch in that scenario and Betaflight does that, you know, automatically. It doesn't move, doesn't allow the filters to move too fast uh, with your throttle moves because it, you know, doesn't want the bi quads to ring and things like that. But here it's the same thing. I wouldn't be overly concerned about it, but I would probably, you know, a W from 10 up. And then uh, obviously, if you want it to be pretty smoothed out, you know, 64 and up. Um, but then you're really not, it's not moving all that much. It would kind of just stay lower. Okay, so hopefully with all that, 
It helps to understand what the IMUF filter is or the dynamic PT1 and how it works, how you can modulate Q and W and how those really work versus the vague description of, you know, higher or lower Qs trust the gyro data more. Like, what the hell does that even mean? It just moves the cutoff up and down. And more importantly, what the W value does, because I think there's probably less understanding of what W does for real and the equations and how it adjusts cutoffs. With this also, the better understanding between the filter types, uh, really the FKF is no longer out there, so it's really these IMUF versus just the static PT1. At the heart, it's the same exact equation. One just has a modulating cutoff based off past samples, the other is just the static, or if you have the dynamic PT1 filters with Betaflight, they're moving up with throttle. The concept with Betaflight and moving the low passes up with throttle is when you do a move, invert, split S, do 180 turn, you don't get prop wash until you start to raise throttle. I mean, when the motors start to spin up to push against the, you know, the opposite direction where you're going, that's where the prop wash starts. And you want the cutoff to raise, you know, raising the cutoff after the prop wash has already started, it's too late. You have to do it before and, you know, doing it based off your stick move, that's the generator of when you're going to start to enter into prop wash, so raising the cutoffs based off your throttle, that's why Betaflight does it that way. Is there some benefit to the Dynamic PT1 this way? Um, sure, I'm sure there's some benefits there. I, I think it needs to get looked at, uh, that E equation, does that get reversed around and jiggered with a little bit differently? But, you know, whenever you make something more dynamic, uh, usually, you know, provides some advantage. Um, whether that advantage is, you know, a hallmark or just, you know, a marginal increase, you know, we have to look at that some more. But um, hopefully with this, again, it's more a little more clear of what all the stuff is and what it's doing. Again, that Excel sheet is out there at tiny.cc forward slash UAV tech. Download it, check it out yourself, and drop any questions, comments down in the comments. Thanks, everybody. I hope this helped.